So in the reading corner today, how pleased am I to be welcoming Peter Frank Pan, who is Professor of Global History at Oxford University and Director of the Oxford Centre for Byzantine Research. He's also Associate Director of the Programme of Silk Road Studies at King's College in Cambridge. He's the author of The First Crusade and The Silk Roads, a wide ranging history that explores the connectedness of Europe, Asia and North Africa. The Silk Roads has been adapted for younger readers and it's lavishly illustrated by Neil Packer. It's now available in paperback. And so I'm really thrilled that we have this opportunity to be talking about a book that I think is so important uh, for education. And I mean that both informally and formally, actually. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you, Nikki, for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be on your podcast. Before we do talk about some of the ideas in your book, I'm interested to find out a little bit more about what captured your imagination. Now, I do know that you have roots in Croatia, which is itself a kind of crossing place between East and West because of its easy access to the Mediterranean and also to the Black Sea. So I wondered where, whether that's where it all started for you. Gosh, well, I feel like I'm on a psychiatrist's couch. I don't know uh, is the answer. I mean, historians are, can, can be quite unreliable about talking about their inspiration. I suppose if I was being candid, what I would say is as a boy growing up, we had a fantastic programme called Newsround on the TV with John Craven every day when I watched the TV. And so as a sort of young boy following the news, it was obvious to me that the things that were dominating news headlines really weren't what was happening in Spain or in Italy or in France and the kind of areas that I spent time in the history classroom learning about, but in other parts of the world. And they were ones that I knew not much about, but they seemed to be extremely important to work out. Why were people having traumatic experiences in other parts of the world? Why was it that the Soviet Union wanted to kill us and we wanted to kill them? Um, you know, why do we have processions of military units you know, protecting the Queen the way she does? You know, what was our, what was our military threat worried about? And I, so I suppose there are all sorts of reasons why I was drawn towards history and towards the regions I work on. But I think a lot of it was to do with, um, with, with what was happening in the news. And in fact, as a young person today, growing up in the world, the th sort of things I'd be thinking about would be, of course, climate. And, you know, that starts, climate questions start with where the big populations are and ones that are burning dirty fuel. And by and large, those aren't in Western Europe, because we're rich enough to be able to afford alternative energy. So I'd be wanting to work out how would we help decarbonize other parts of the world. I'd be, I'd be following and re realizing there's a lot of migration and people trying to cross the channel. I'd be trying to work out why, where are they coming from, uh, and you know why they're choosing Britain rather than anywhere else. Um, and you know the big changes in the world that I work on: the Middle East, South Asia, China in particular, and, and increasingly West Africa. I'm spending a lot of time looking at too. Uh, those should be things that the next generation of thinkers, business people, teachers, charity workers, doctors, nurses, whatever it might be, need to be understanding that big wide world out there. Can I ask you now, as we turn our attention to, to your book, The Silk Roads, and particularly this adaptation for children, uh, did the idea come from you or from the publisher? Absolutely from me. So Silk Roads took off all around the world and it was a sort of success beyond my wildest dreams and you know as an academic I, I don't have any expectation that people will read what I'm writing about and I can promise you I've been to enough dinner parties where I, where I mentioned the word Uzbekistan or nomads or, or oral, oral traditions and people change the subject as quickly as they can so you know I didn't expect there would be uh, a success that it has had around the world but one of the lovely things when you write a book and particularly a successful book is you get invited to come and talk and because I've got young children because I'm interested in younger ed younger people's education too what I would always do at the beginning and what I still say in, in, in seminars in Oxford is that the first people to get to speak should be the youngest ones. So I'd always say if there's anybody here who's under the age, and I, I started by saying under 18, and there was never anybody under 18. And then eventually I says, if there's anybody under the age of 25, put your hand up if you have a question. Uh, and after I'd done that for a, about a year, um, I was talking with my publisher who'd been fantastic, incredibly supportive. And I said, you know, one day what I'd love to do is to write a children's version of this book because there are, there are three problems with the curriculum. One is that there's not enough materials for teachers to learn about other parts of the world. Second one is what, what can parents help their children learn and think about? They need to be educated too. And then the third thing is what can what is there for children to read? And, you know, I spoke with Bloomsbury, my publisher, and, you know, there have been enormous sales of fiction, you know, Harry Potter onwards. 
but the amount of shelf space for non-fiction for children is absolutely minuscule. And the stuff that's there, it's sort of either list-based or very dry, or sort of extremely practical. So I spoke to my publisher and I said, look, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that one day. It's so important. I would love one day to walk into a room filled with young people and say, what do you want to know about the world around us? I might not be able to answer, but, you know, I'll ask and let's let's talk talk through it. And they didn't say anything. And then about a week later, they rang me up and they said, you know, are you serious? You know, we'd love you to do a children's book, but no author's ever wanted to do that before. And it's sort of rare. And um, and I said, look, I think it would be great. And I'm not going to lie, Nikki, it was much harder, I think, to write this one for children than it was to write the the, the Mothership Silk Roads book. Um, but not only to have I not regretted it, I've loved the fact that now other historians have fallen in my footsteps. Other publishers have worked out that there's a market for it. And, you know, from David Olashoga, great friends of mine writing kids' versions, Harari writing a version of Sapiens. What, one of the questions I've always asked is, why has it taken so long for serious books written for adult audiences to be put in a format that younger people and, and you know, also older people too, not everybody who's a grown up wants to read a 600 page book and wants to get through. And, and in fact, I didn't want it to be called a children's version. It's an illustrated version that's a shorter, distilled version that can be read by whoever wants to read it. Neil Paco, the illustrations are absolutely mm-hmm. magnificent. And they're not dumbed down. You know, all these mm-hmm. illustrations in the book, they are references to images. They're references to the past. And Neil really understood what serious history should look like for a smart, engaged reader who wants to know about the history of the Silk Reds. And although it's called the Silk Reds, it's really a history of, of the world, the main themes in world history. Neil Packer has also done fabulous illustrations of the Odyssey and the Iliad. So obviously in that classical world, he, you know, really enjoys communicating. Um, really, I, would never compare, I would never compare myself to a musician, but, you know, I, I do understand that, you know, Elton John without Bernie Taupin, without the lyricist, you know, that these things, they all work together. So if I had, you know, sent off a book, sent off a text and said, good luck and, edit, you know, come back with the images. Or if Neil had said, this is what I've read, here are the images. But, you know, there was a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion, a lot of comparing notes. And, um, you know, it's great to work in a, a, as a, as a team like that. So he was the right person for the right man in the right place for the right thing. And it was an absolute joy working with him and explaining, you know, what it is we wanted. So the inside flaps of the covers are cocoon, silkworm cocoons. And you don't need to know that maybe don't even care, maybe don't even notice. But if you do, you know, there are all these little references that are there. So he, he's been fantastic. Can I just ask you, if you could briefly tell us, you said that it was more difficult than writing the mother ship, um, as you put it. So tell me what those difficulties were. What were the challenges? Well, first, the, the, the first one is is of space. Um, you know, there's a limited amount of of pages that you can, you know, that the, the book is can be. And so there's only a certain number of words. And so if you're going to cover the rise of Islam or you're going to cover the Second World War, you know, you have to gallop through it at speed. But these are complicated topics. They're also, Mm -hmm. in many cases, extremely sensitive ones where you need to be balanced and need to provide a perspective that allows people to uh, not necessarily agree or disagree, but to follow you. Right. And to be able Mm -hmm. to ask questions as a result. So I think that that's part of it. Second, uh, the academic register, you know, you're used to be able to throw footnotes like confetti basically to sort of protect yourself from people saying you got things wrong or, or where these ideas come from. And that, that obviously doesn't exist too. Uh, but, you know, it, it, the, the biggest challenge with writing Silk Roads in the first place is what do you put in and what do you leave out? And with Silk Roads, I was quite provocative on purpose. You know, I leave, I leave out the Battle of Hastings um, because although that was important in, from Britain's point of view, um, you know, it wasn't particularly important for the rest of the world. So, you can glance to those kinds of things in a book where you have the you, you're you're allowed to sort of have a paragraph that you can explain what else has happened and why and the revolution etc. Much harder to do that where it's much bald it's much skinnier a book like this and mm-hmm. you know younger people who it is sort of aimed at although like I said I'm delighted everybody reads it um, you know they're not stupid and uh, skinniness doesn't mean simple doesn't mean narrowing it down. Uh, so it's a real sort of art form, I think, to, to be able to let it be critically OK so that you don't have sort of gaps and holes or problems or oversimplifications. And, you know, I had to learn how to how to, how to get get that right. Getting into a little bit more detail, I found your metaphor of the human body with the archeries and tributaries uh, really compelling. But it's a world where the heart shifts 
through the book. And I wonder whether you could just tell us a little bit about that idea of how the heart has shifted over time. Well, I guess, you know, what I would sometimes use to describe history as, as you know, uh, going to see the doctor and, um, you know, lots of people can tell you if you've got bruising or if there's something wrong, you know, there's something clearly wrong, you're bleeding, you know, we can all tell there's something that's problematic, but actually to to really understand, you've got to look underneath the skin. I mean, we even call it um, skin deep, don't we, if, you, if something's superficial. So understanding how the world really is configured and how it functions, you know, means understanding, I, I, you know, the veins in the arteries, the heart, as you mentioned. And that's not my idea. That's one that goes back thousands and thousands of years of, of philosophers comparing the world and societies and individual states to the human body. And I suppose from a, looking at big history over, over a few thousand years like I do, it's trying to work out where's the, where's the action happening. And with the body, that's always where's, where's the heart. And that's, that's driven by lots of different things. It's driven by um, availability of resources. That changes, you know, with the discovery of, of oil um, in Iran in uh, the beginning of the 20th century, fundamentally changed what the Middle East was for Western Europeans. As a boy growing up, uh, China was an old faded empire under a communist regime uh, with a minimal part of the global economy and not a particularly important regional footprint. Forget about a global one. Now it's the most important political, social and ec economic question in the world. And, and those are functions of, like I said, of resources, of demographics and population, of energy consumption, of ability of the economy to grow. And if you have suddenly lots of people who pay for things in other parts of the world and buy them, then things change. So for example, right now, about a third of all luxury goods are consumed or bought by Chinese consumers. And in 1990, the percentage was zero. 250 million Chinese people a year were traveling before mm. the pandemic. And that's much, much bigger. And they spend a lot more than Americans do. So those big shifts, those big seismic shifts are complicated. They, they never happen overnight. They burn over many, many decades. And that's why studying and understanding those rhythms of history are so important. And I think that, that some of the, the skill of, of history is, is trying to find a way that makes it relevant or in the kind of modern world too. You know, a lot of the themes that I'm interested in about migration, about climate, about religion and beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, about cooperation, about empire, those are all equally interesting questions to ask about Facebook or Google or China as they are to ask about, you know, the Han dynasty or to ask about, you know, the great uh, empire of Ashoka or to ask about West African Ghanaian kingdoms in the Middle Ages. You've mentioned West Africa quite a few times. Actually, one of the questions that I did want to ask you is that you, uh, it, it is big history. Uh, you cover a time span of 6,000 years from the birth of civilization to modern times. Um, what doesn't get as, as much of a mention is perhaps some of those African empires like the Swahili kingdom, which obviously was very connected to the Arab world. You can only do so much, I know, in a book of this size. But what's the position of those sorts of uh, civilizations to our understanding of the world? Well, hugely important. I mean, the book is called Silk Roads. So, I mean, it is specifically about the connections that link Asia and Europe, and particularly North Africa. But as you say, it's impossible to cover everything. In fact, the new thing that I'm working on has much bigger focuses on parts of the world that I don't have a chance to write about. So pre-Columbian history, for example, the, the, the history of the Americas, North and South and Central America, before the arrival of the Europeans, you know, it's very hard to fit that into a book that's about connectivity mm -hmm. between, you know, South Asia, China, etc. But I do think with the Silk Roads in particular, they have had such an important role in shaping global history, mm -hmm. um, including into other parts, into West Africa as well, that I think that it's trying to it's trying to stay focused on all of that. Like I said, whether you you, you use the image of a heart or I suppose of a, of a Tom Cruise film, you know, that's where the action is. You've got to be following where Tom is mm -hmm. and the Silk Roads is, is the right place to stand. But you can stand in other parts of the world and look at global and world and regional history in different ways too. But mm -hmm. the thing that I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time working on, on West Africa in particular, but also looking at some of the Mississippian cultures in the southwest of America, looking at Olmec and uh, pre-Inca dynasties in South America and, and the Maya and so on, because I'm educating myself as well. I'd like to talk a little bit, if I may, about historiography and the methods used, because I, in one of the 
articles um, that you'd written that I read. Uh, you talk about the usual sources, documents and so on. But you also said increasingly science. I'm really interested in how disciplines work together. And I wondered if you could give us some specific examples of how science has helped to develop your knowledge and understanding of the history that you're working on. Well, so historians always have to use rely on sources. And of course, for most of us, that means people have written things hundreds or thousands or a few years ago. And how do we use those to help us look through those as a prism to understand the past? Um, you know, as you get a bit more advanced in your research, then archaeology and finding archaeological remains are important. And obviously, with archaeology, the science behind that is changing too. It's no, you know, it's not just about what you dig and find. You know, radiocarbon dating and improvements in in its accuracy is moving quite quickly, and um, some of those things are quite surprising. So, for example, you can tell what people have eaten based on their on skeletal remains. And for some reason, it's come out in the last sort of six months or so that fish-based diets throw out radiocarbon by a quite significant margin of error. So you've got to be extremely careful when handling all of this. And as a historian, you've got to you've got to be following and understanding what those margins of error are, how they're calculated, who's calculating them, what kind of sample sizes you need. But you know, to give an example of again some of the things I'm working on at the moment with climate science, we can tell a huge amount about change in rainfall, in aridity or lack of rainfall. Um, from things like lake sediments, from fossilized pollen, from speleothems, from sort of calcium carbonate buildups in caves. And those have very important lessons about, about how climate was changing in the past or what climate actually was, you know, how much agriculture was it possible to produce from one place or another. Uh, so in climate science, that's a hugely important uh, and exciting area right now. But, you know, across the board, if you find a bunch of coins buried in the ground, being able to use statistical modeling to work out what does that mean about how many coins might have been produced in the same batch? How many were in circulation at the same time? What does that tell us about the size of the economy? What does it tell us about the quality or purity of the gold or the silver, if they're precious metal? Those kinds of things are, are fundamental to being a historian because the way which, not just we do in the UK, the way in which we think about history is we call it part of the humanities and we think that it's all about written sources. Mm -hmm. But there's no difference to me between history and geography and theology or divinity, religion. There's no difference between um, history and biology, increasingly, understanding genomics, you know, being able to find how people are moving, what are they eating, looking at their tooth enamel uh, and measuring it and being able to tell whether with accuracy who they're related to and, and where they're getting their food from are, are not just sort of the icing on cakes. They can fundamentally change how we think about the past, the more rounded you can be, the more 360 degree views you can take about whether it's pandemics, whether it's about disease, whether it's about demographics, the more likely you are to understand what's going on. So in fact, in 2019, I was asked into number 10 to advise the government on the next 10 years of what the challenges and opportunities would be. And I said, in a globalized world where we have high density population and very fast communication networks, the only thing we should be worrying about is a pandemic. And if you're going to worry about anything else, it's the lack of a global response to pandemic, because they're very easy to anticipate and they're very easy to, to prepare for. But less than 5% of funding in pharmaceuticals went into vaccines for viruses like this. And if we'd been more on our toes, rather than spending billions and tens of billions and hundreds of billions by the time you have economic support, it would have cost us a, a tiny, tiny fraction of that if we'd been aware of the fact that when people live together and could hop on planes and get anywhere in 18 hours, they can spread disease. So that's in my Silk Roads book too. The yeah. Black Death follows travellers, merchants, warriors. And when we interact with each other, you know, we don't just learn about nice new foods or good fashion. We, we spread disease too. Yeah. The teaching of history in, edu in schools and education is probably the most contested subject, actually. Um, and probably for obvious reasons, because of how it's dealing with ideas and it's dealing with politics. And so it's going to be contested. And we traditionally have focused on British history. When I asked somebody this question the other day, another historian, uh, they said that every nation starts with its own stories. But that leaves me with a big question about how do you understand your own story unless you understand how it's connected to other people's stories? I don't think there's a problem about, about starting at home. The question is how much energy and effort do you invest into, into that process? So, I mean, again, I've had children go through the school system and they've spent a whole entire school term on the Battle of Waterloo. 
where individual soldiers were standing doesn't seem to me necessarily the best investment of time and energy. So it's how deep do you cut into the story of Henry VIII and his wives? And actually, where are we starting? So I suppose if I had a clean slate, I'd start the other way around, which is I'd want to know in history what, what has worked, right? What has functioned successfully? You know, what is it that is important in history? And those kinds of, I'd break into different kinds of themes. You know, why do some people persecute each other because of skin color or because of religion or for economic reasons? How, how do we understand why it is that people subjugate and, and look at different case studies for that? You know, the truth is empires always try to get labor forces to do things for them, either for free or through discrimination. And so in that sense, all empires are doing the same kinds of things. Some through mechanization can do things much, much, much worse than others, right? If you have big ships that you can transport millions of people across the, the Atlantic in, then the slave trade is is huge. If you're shipping them on smaller dows from East Africa into the Islamic world, which happened a great deal, or from Scandinavia and from Ireland to what's now Russia, then the, the, the quantum is smaller, but the, still the process is always the same. So I think what one tries to look at is why, why is it that people fight? How do good administrations work? Which societies have been more fair, more equitable than others? How they engage with crisis, including climate, including famine, including disease, and, and to try to do things that are looking at these big themes, perhaps moving away from the worry about being pinned by geography and also being pinned by chronology. I mean, young people are perfectly able to understand that a guy in a suit of armour in the 11th century is not the same as uh, an Elizabethan or a Victorian. But what similar questions did they, those people have and uh, how were they answered? You know, what was the role of women in different societies in different periods? But I think we, we, we suffer from oversimplifying and trying to make things too uh, reductive because we treat young people like they're stupid. But, you know, I've never met a young person, my children, their friends, any school I've ever spoken to, and certainly writing Silk Roads, who isn't able to understand that we're part of this massive, big texture of history. And as you say, to have a kind of wider context is important. So, I mean, for example, the Tudors, which I did three times at school, different ages, no one ever explained to me that the most important part of the Tudor story was the fact that the Spanish king, who was uh, the, the um, nephew of Catherine of Aragon, had just hit the jackpot by nicking all of the gold and silver from the Aztecs and was about to get even more of the Spanish from the Americas. And so Henry VIII's decision to divorce Catherine, to then marry Anne Boleyn, wasn't just that he was a sort of fat man with a, who, with a big libido, or he didn't like the Pope and the, the Catholic Church, which I learned a lot about. It was about this competition that became a transatlantic one, where Henry VIII was out of position against his biggest rivals, who was a kind of multi-rollover lottery winner, and so Henry, to compete with that, the cheapest and softest source of getting a lot of money and material and gold and what precious metal was from the church. And so that context of a big global story wasn't how Henry had been explained to me. I've got lots of Tudor historian friends of mine, by the way, who don't agree with me on that. But I think it's fine to have those, those wider perspectives, whether, whether you argue the toss about whether that's justifiable or not, it's, it's another story. But I, I do think it's important to be looking at these bigger questions rather than history as a series of nice, interesting stories about what happened during the fire of London or what happened in the Battle of Hastings when maybe maybe King Harold got shot in the eye with an arrow, maybe he didn't. But, you know, why are we teaching those stories? You know, what, what are we expecting students in the classroom to learn from that? I've got one last question for you. And that is that at the beginning of the Silk Roads, you present a very optimistic view for children. You tell readers that this is the best time that they could uh, uh, possibly be living in. And you also write that we study history to understand the past, but also to help us understand the present. I suppose my question is really an observation that that's not necessarily a given and that you can uh, study the past in order to construct a present of your choice and even a future. So it's not always an optimistic thing. Uh, it's a perfectly fair point. And I, I don't disagree with you, Nikki, but I, I don't think it's my job to puncture the hopes and dreams of young people, first. Second, given a choice between optimism and cold pragmatism, and, you know, I, I would always choose the first. As it happens, I do not just believe that this is the best time in history. I know that because that's what the facts and the data tells me. So it's not an opinion. It's based on the fact that if you, today, any child born, while this podcast is being made, 
uh, will have the longest life expectancy in human history, the highest chances of uh, maternal health care that, that their mother would survive childbirth, the highest chance of having access to clean water and not being infected by disease, uh, the highest chance of being able to read and write as they get older. Um, so, you know, although we can get misled by thinking the world is a gloomy, terrible place in the pandemic, you know, we're all doomed and we're all about to fight wars, you know, just in your my lifetimes, we've lived through a period of extraordinary peace and growth and economic well-being and and uh you know there have been places in the world where it's been absolutely horrific syria for example in iraq afghanistan too um but you know by and large globally this has been an unusual and exceptional last 40 50 years thank you so much for joining me in the reading corner today i have a ton of questions i didn't get the chance to ask uh, because you have given me such uh, interesting answers and food for thought. So, so thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, Nikki. In the Reading Corner is presented by Nikki Gamble and produced by Alison Hughes. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please do leave a review for us. To find out about other projects, including an audience with events and the Exploring Children's Literature Summer School, visit www.exploringchildrensliterature.uk. Join us again soon in the Reading Corner on your favourite podcast platform.